My name is Anthony Paliuka, and I'm excited today to talk about lodge safety for our Masonic brethren. Today we're going to talk about some different things that are hopefully designed to increase the safety and the security of your lodge, and which in turn will create a more comfortable environment in which to practice the craft. Our goals for today are going to be to introduce dialogue around lodge safety. We're going to recognize ways to mitigate threats. We're going to talk about how and when should we call for help. And we're going to talk about two starting points in developing a plan. Lastly, we're going to examine opportunities to assist in this effort and to keep things safe for everyone. So we've talked about lodge safety. What we're really talking about is a safe environment to be at. Uh, it includes safety, fire, facility issues, floods, natural disasters, whatever that might be. Uh, Dr. Henry Maslow, back in the 50s, created a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which basically states you have to get to one level on the bottom before you can go to the next level. For example, if you don't have safety and security, you can't have belonging, a sense of connection. If you don't have a sense of connection, you can't have self-esteem, so on and so on. The goal being to get to the top of the pyramid, which is self-actualization, we're living our best life, everything is wonderful. Maslow argued that survival needs must be satisfied before the individual can satisfy the higher needs. So the way that translates for us is, if things aren't safe and secure in our lodges, we're not able to fully embrace the work we're trying to do. And it makes it difficult to have these distractions that could cause us to be unsafe. So we talk about modern threats that we face for our lodges throughout the state. One of the ones obviously that's been a recent challenge is electronic surveillance issues. That's, that's been a newer kind of on the scene issue and it's concerning for everyone. Crime, crime visits every building, it visits every business. It can happen anywhere, anytime. Cybersecurity issues, anything social media, your website, as you might've had some issues with spam in your email, that's an example of cybersecurity. Uh, behavioral health related issues, perhaps you have some seekers that are visiting you and they've got some pretty significant challenges that could become an issue. That's something that could possibly be a threat. Obviously, violent, violent individuals as well. There are some criminal elements that will be out and about and they're always trying to see what they can pull over on somebody and they're definitely a concern. Lastly, of course, fires, natural disasters, things we can't necessarily prevent, but we can always be on the lookout for. And hopefully with building our team today, we're talking about, we'll be able to mitigate these threats. When we talk about threat mitigation, we're talking about starting a discussion first. To know what our problem is, we need to know what it is not. So I would encourage you to have an assessment done. Many local police agencies will offer an officer or detective to come around and do what's called a safety tour. They'll walk around your building, they'll identify po possible threats, but then some opportunities to make your building more secure. That's a great resource. I know it's not available everywhere in the state, but if you can check with your resources and see what you have, it could be a very good tool for you. You want to know your local resources. Who are your local law enforcement people? Do you have sheriff's deputies? Do you have marshals? Do you have police officers? Who are your EMS folks? How do you get a hold of them? What behavioral health resources do you have? Do you have mobile crisis teams available? Do you have psychiatric ERs? What's available should you have either a brother in need or a community member that's coming out to your lodge and having these issues? And also, what resources do you have? As you know, within the craft, there's an amazing amount of diverse brothers that are practicing. Some are in law enforcement, some are in public safety, EMS, fire, medicine. These are folks you can also tap into to be part of your team to help you mitigate threats. So once you have all that data, you've identified your strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities, you're gonna develop a plan. A question that comes to mind, and you probably already thought about this, is when should we start this plan? Well, I can't really say it much better than this, so the best time to plant the tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And that's, that's very eloquent, much more eloquent than I could be. And it's true. If you haven't had a plan, it's not too late. We're gonna to start to like a plan today. So when we talk about risk and how to mitigate it, there's different ways to do it. One of the ways we're working on at Scottsdale 43 is creating a safety team. We wanna create a team of folks, so fellow Masons that are gonna be part of this team that are, the goal is to keep things safe. We're working on developing a plan and we want to think about what do we do if in the event we have a violent individual that comes to the lodge or someone at the lodge becomes violent? What do we do if someone has a medical emergency, whether that's uh, during when lodge is in session versus having a meal? What happens if there's a catastrophe, if a tree falls and crushes the roof, if a tractor trailer hits our lodge? What do we do? If there's a power outage, what's the protocol? How do we safely evacuate all of our brothers out safely and our guests? One thing that comes to mind when I think about planning and mitigating is aviation. If you think about it in airlines, it's checklist after checklist after checklist. The time to think about a problem is not when the problem is happening, as you can imagine. So for aviation, they drill and drill and drill. What happens if an engine comes out? What happens if both engines come out? What happens if someone tries to breach the door? 
They've already thought of all these things. They've practiced these things. They've reviewed them. And so that's something we can borrow from is how to ha access that kind of safety by following their model. And again, once you have all the plans developed, we're going to share with the membership. A safety plan is only as good as the people that are aware of it. If people aren't aware of this plan, the right people, I should say, we want to make sure that these are folks that are your masons, not necessarily your visitors. We don't want to give away our playbook. So when we talk about a safety team, what is a safety team? Well, essentially, it's Masons ensuring a safe experience for everyone. That's our goal. And it can include, again, it's, it's safety, not necessarily security teams, because safety encompasses more than security. Safety is going to encompass, is your facility safe? Do you have a wire shorting out above your dishwasher and that has to be addressed? Do you have medical, uh, both equipment and know how to take care of it? And what are your security needs? The goal for the safety team is that it's professional and low key. Not unlike a church security team, it's very low key, very in the background, it's not obtrusive, but in the event that it's needed, it's needed. And of course, we wanna be friendly and helpful. We wanna create a welcoming environment. To that end, ideally, your safety team and your welcoming committee looks like this. We're welcoming people, we're encouraging them to come in and explore the wonderful world that we get to live in. We don't want your lodge to be like this. We don't want it to be a supermax prison. You can't come in, it's cold vibes, that's not good for anybody. So. Keep in mind when we're talking about safety, we want it to be welcoming, but it can also be a safe environment as well. A good example of this practice is the San Francisco Police Department. Their patch for decades has said, oro en paz, fiero en guerra, which means gold and peace, steel in war. Good way of looking at that is when things are peaceful and we can be really kind, we're golden. When things turn bad and we have to kind of go to war, we're steel. So basically what they're doing is adjusting how they act based on the stimulus they're getting, which is not a bad way to look at things in the lodge as well. Everything's good, we're welcoming and kind. If things take a turn, we're gonna adjust as well. So we talk about when to get help. I'm a big believer in calling for help early. If you think you need to get law enforcement there, you need to get law enforcement there. No one's ever regretted getting help there and saying, oh, we're so good, we thought it was gonna be this, it turned out to be a small issue, thanks so much for stopping by. That's really important. In fire department world, they have the exp expression, little fire, little, wire, little water. So if you can get to an issue when it's small, that's great, you only can take care of it with a fire extinguisher. You wait too long, you got a huge five alarm blaze. So when do we call 911? Well, trust your instincts. As I said earlier, call early and often. If you think you need a call, call. Unless you're making up a reason to call, which obviously you wouldn't do, there's never a reason not to call. It's not illegal to call because you're suspicious or curious. If your local agency has a non-emergency number and it's not an emergency, you're welcome to call that number. Learn that. That's part of what you should be learning when you do your research. What are your assets? What are your resources? So I can call non-emergency and say, hey, there's like four people by our dumpster. They're dumpster diving. They're not welcome here. We have it posted, no trespassing. I'd like you to help with that. They'll respond. If it's an emergency, call 911. Something else to consider, when you call for the police, you're gonna get a couple of friendly officers. That's what you're gonna get. You're gonna get this. You're gonna have an officer that's there. Hi, what can I do for you? How can I support you? You're not gonna get this. You're not gonna get a SWAT team repelling down helicopters, kicking in doors. You know, now again, if you need that for your emergency, they're gonna send that. But if you just need someone to come talk to someone that's acting a little bit froggy, it's gonna be a simple conversation. So sometimes people get nervous that it's gonna be a huge uh, hullabaloo, if you will, and it doesn't have to be that. It can be a very simple conversation where officers take someone to the side, they talk to them and say, hey, there's some concern about your behavior, what you're doing is not really typical, what's your deal? They would run that individual, see if they have any warrants, if they're wanted, and then deal with it from there. So again, I really encourage you to tap into your safety network, and you'll find if you haven't already made relationships with your local police and fire, EMS, sheriffs, they're really, supportive of Masonic life. They really, everyone has an appreciation and understanding that it's a cornerstone of our culture. And so you're gonna find that they're pretty great folks and probably, you know, hopefully either they're gonna be members or they already are part of the craft. So when we talk about getting police assistance, any emergency you can call 911. If it's an emergency in progress, call 911. The first thing you wanna do is give your location. If you could only give one piece of information, Give your location. Where are you calling from? Give your ad, get your address, or if you're a prominent building in your town, you can say, I'm at the Masonic Lodge. Call, let them know. Then they're gonna ask you what's going on. Why are you calling? Hi, there's a guy here and he cut his leg. He's bleeding really bad. He's really odd. It seems unsafe. They're gonna ask you a bunch of questions. It can be frustrating, but you're gonna answer all their questions. What the person looks like. Are there weapons? Is there a vehicle? Where they're located? Do not hang up until they tell you to hang up. Something most people don't know is that while you're talking to one dispatcher, they're typing on the computer what's happening, it gets sent to a radio dispatcher that's talking to the police. 
So the person you're talking to is not the person talking to the officers. While you're talking, they're typing and sending it directly over. So the more important the issue is, the faster the response will be. So please don't think while you're answering their questions that's slowing down the help. It is not. The help is en route. While you're talking, they're updating officers, they're sending messages to their computers, they're sending messages over the radio. It's happening. So simultaneously, as you're talking, they can also be sending officers. So don't think that you have to hang up the phone before they send the help. That's not how that works. Another thing that's really easy, a really good safety practice, you'll see at most modern uh, government buildings, uh, best practices for corporations and different agencies that have a pretty good preventative safety structure, is name badges. Who are you? How do we know if someone's a member, if they're a visitor, if they're a guest? There's some easy ways to handle that. It's a very good foundational way to keep your lodge safe. Know who the people are that are there. It also increases fellowship. If I can look at someone's jacket and go, oh, hey, Robert, how you doing? It's good to see you. It's been a while. You've been out of town or you've been traveling. Yeah, Anthony, it's cool. It's good to see you because I have my name tag as well. That's very helpful. So it's fellowship, but also a secondary benefit is it increases your security posture and helps quite a bit. Um, one thing that we're looking at doing is getting color-coded name badges. It makes it really kind of simple at a glance to see what people are doing, who they are, and what they're with. Uh, much like how the military wears uniforms so you can identify who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, that's kind of what your name badges can do as well. We're lucky here locally in Maricopa County because we have Jerry, Worshipful Brother Jerry at Mesa Sign and Stamp who does a great job on making name badges and all kinds of options. And of course, it's always nice to support small business, but also Masonically owned. It's kind of a win-win. Here's some examples of things that he came up for us to just consider and our leadership still working on the definitive final version, but just some examples I wanted to share with you. You can have color code. You can have your Masons have one color, your Seekers have another color, your Distinguished Visitors have another color. And so you would issue that clip-on badge when they arrive, and then when they leave, you get it back. If it's Seekers and you're worried about these things going away, you can always ask for their driver's license, put it in a bin, and in exchange, they get, the, they get the Seeker badge for the night. Or you can number them. There's any number of ways you could do. Some lodges might consider when someone's in the pipeline and you after they've, you know, they've, after they've kind of been in the process to become a Mason, maybe they get a junior varsity name badge, whatever you decide you want to do, there's lots of options there. But again, if at a glance I can see from 30 feet away that someone's wearing the appropriate uh, emblem or badge for our lodge, that's really helpful. And again, that's not the end all be all. You still want to know if you've never seen that person, we're still going to talk to them. We're still going to have a conversation, but it's a layer of prevention. That's what we're talking about here, building layers, going from nothing to even just having universal name badges is really positive. You might consider as you're starting implementing this policy to have a thing where if you're wearing a name badge, you get a raffle ticket. And anyone that's at the lodge that night gets a raffle ticket and they can win a prize for the first month or so as you roll this out. And then when it's done, you don't have a name badge, we're gonna have some questions and maybe it's not a good fit for you to be here tonight. Again, it's up to you. Do what's best for your lodge. Just wanted to give you some options. Another option is that you have Masons display their current dues card or be able to log into Grandview to confirm their standing. Whatever vetting process you do, be consistent and implement it accordingly. Consider having safety practices for, what's our practices for our visiting Masons? For our visiting Masons from foreign jurisdictions, what's our policy for first time visitors? These are things to consider. You might consider having your committee that does the examinations. It could be the Tyler, Marshall, and Deacons, for example. You can't be too safe and you can't be too secure. And as you can imagine, if you're visiting a lodge in a different state or country and you're being vetted and, and kind of screened, you'll appreciate that they're keeping you safe as well. So we're going to be patient and we're going to also expect our visitors to be patient and appropriate. We're not asking too much to take a minute to just to inform ourselves if they're appropriate and they should be here or not. Again, you're protecting yourself, you're protecting your community, and you're protecting everyone that's inside of your building. So a practice that I'd like you to think about is that essentially everyone in your lodge has been screened. Again, there's no perfect world. But if for a minute, if we could pretend that we could have a perfect world, we're screening people outside. Hey, welcome. It's good to have you here. Tonight we're having pot roast. Welcome. Can you put your name badge on? Do you need a sticker? What can we do? Screen people. So ideally, when your door is closed and you have your meal, everyone there has been screened. They're known entities or they're vouched for or it makes sense. Someone can say, Who's that over there? Why is this person here? If individuals are late, you might just post a sign on the door saying, hey, if you're late after we start our meal or after we start within the lodge, give us a call. You can call someone on the safety team, make a plan that works for you, ring a doorbell. Again, we wanna try and limit access so people can just wander in off the streets and do whatever they might do. Again, safety can start outside of your door. It's a good practice to consider. 
do a walkthrough. Maybe while the lodge is in session or while they're having a meal, your safety team kind of rotates around. They walk around. You're greeting people. You're confirming the right people are here. They should be there. And periodic checks. Again, we want to be proactive, not reactive. We can walk around proactively, identify problems when they're small. They won't get big. And all this can accomplish some increased safety and security for all of the people that are in our building and under our roof. Tyler has responsibilities, of course, going back to day one where they function as, uh, you know, kind of that uh, gatekeeper and making sure the right people are where they should be. In a perfect world, you might consider if there's a way to increase your cameras at your facility. We would love to see eventually where our Tyler can have an iPad and can visualize who's outside of the door. So again, leverage security and technology for you. You might look at grants, you might look at fundraisers. There's smaller things you can do now, especially with Wi-Fi security cameras that are very affordable that can help your security stance quite a bit. And of course, we're gonna to wanna to communicate as much as possible. Whether that's radios, which we'll talk about in a second, or texting, the more communication, the better for what's happening, what's going on, and what do we need. When we talk about safety, something else you might consider is in your interior lodge. You might consider having a safety team defender, someone that's there on the team for safety, that's listening either in an earpiece or has a phone they can text on, who knows what's happening outside of the tiled lodge. That person can help keep an eye on things, keep things safe. What you wanna have is a plan. The last thing you can afford to do if you have a violent incident within your lodge that needs to be addressed is have random people pulling out firearms and weapons and employing them how they want. There's crossfire considerations, there's blue on blue considerations. There's lots of things that can go wrong really fast. So really, our goal is prevention here. That's where the goal, not postvention, not how can we become snipers in the lodge. We wanna prevent an issue. And so that's for you and your team at your lodge to decide, but please really take it seriously. They can think about the consideration. So if you had someone that's identified as a safety team defender, they could sit in a strategic location, they could watch things so that they're safe, and you can decide what that looks like with them. But they need to be in continuous conversation. Ongoing training, we've got to have ongoing training, defensive tactics, as well as CPR, first aid, and stop the bleed classes. These are all available through Red Cross, online, local hospitals can teach you. These are things that are more likely to happen than someone that's coming in with a rifle to hurt people. We've got to learn first aid. We've got to make sure we know continuous chest compressions or CPR, and as well as how to stop a bleed. For exit procedures, when you're ready to close down the lodge for the night, you wanna make sure the, the lighting is on and working before you leave. Uh, some lodges might have a timer in their parking lot. Make sure that thing is cranked up and your light is on so that people are safe to leave. We also always like the buddy system. It's worked for decades since we were in kindergarten. Why not use it now? Have people go out together. And again, think about your safety team. If you have enough people that can do it, have some folks inside and some folks roving outside. That's wonderful to kind of, again, we're encouraging collegiality, we're having a safety stance, and we're also knowing what's happening. If we can prevent a problem before it gets big, that's the goal here. Some equipment needs. You might consider, again, depending on your ability and length of your cable toe, what you can get done, having a discrete portable radio system, having some security cameras and monitors. In 2024, these things are not very expensive. They've gotten much more efficient, much more affordable to where you can get a set of radios with earpieces, not very much money. And again, it's a good investment so you can communicate. I know that everybody has cell phones, but if you can imagine in a time of crisis, trying to text out a message or call, a lot of times our fine motor skills go out the window when there's a huge crisis. Whereas you can just hit a button on your radio and say, there's a threat in the parking lot. Here's what it is, lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. Again, whatever that looks like for your community, for your lodge, do what's comfortable for you, but think about it. That's all I'm asking you to do is consider what you do. The what ifs are huge. Really encourage you to consider too, a stop the bleed kit. There's different companies that make them. North American Rescue is one that is a big provider that does military and special ops and all that stuff. It's high quality stuff. Unfortunately, there are tourniquets on Amazon and some other third party resellers that are counterfeit. And when you try and cinch up the Velcro and clamp down the, the lanyard or the windlass rather, uh, it's gonna fail. And that's not the time to find out you've got a fake kit is when there's an emergency. So you might consider, again, investing in a bleeding control kit and how to train with it. What do we do with this thing? What are these tourniquets? What does this stop the bleed gauze? How do I put this pressure on somebody? Train, 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 it's really important. The goal is the more you train, if you ever have to deploy it, you're gonna be really great with it. You also wanna consider some building signage. Do you have no trespassing signs? Do you have cameras and service signs? What do you have that can send a message outside that you guys take security seriously, you take safety secure seriously, and you're gonna handle business? So question you might be asking yourself is how can I help? How can I serve my lodge? Well, the good news is everyone has to be responsible for safety. Everyone that's at our lodge is responsible for safety. It's very important. Your lodge might develop a safety team and they're gonna need help. 
whether you go every week, every month, talk to your leadership at your lodge and see how you can serve because it's a great way to get involved. If perhaps you're not always able to make it for degrees, that's fine. There are ways you can contribute. Talk to your team, talk about no badge, let's ask questions. Hi, I don't see this person. This person hasn't come around, which leads me to a point. If you travel a lot, perhaps across the world, or you work quite a bit, so you only get to your mother lodge a couple times a year, if when you do go, you don't have the right badge, or you are challenged by the safety team there, let's be kind and remember, oh, they're doing their job. They're challenging me because they don't recognize me because I'm not here a lot, fair enough, but they're doing it, the system is working. So if you are challenged by somebody and perhaps you're like, I've been here 40 years and I just took some time off, take a pause and go, the system's working. They're asking if I belong here, which is great. So if you just kind of view it in that way, it might be a little bit easier to digest because sometimes our feathers can get ruffled. We're humans, it happens, but just have that consideration I think might be helpful. So some future activities you'd want to think about with your lodge is ongoing safety training. This is not a one and done situation. You're always going to want to train. You're going to want to have brief training presentations to your whole group. You might consider annual refreshers for everyone to talk about safety. Hey, the event, if there's an incident here, we're going to escape here. If there's an event here, we can go ahead and, you know, go and have a place of refuge back here. Have a plan, but the plan is only as good as if you share it. With that sharing, you're also going to review and revise your plan. Much like so many other things, it's ever evolving. The plan that you have today will look way different in five years, and that's okay. We're going to grow, we're going to adapt, and we're going to overcome. You're also going to want to train your pipeline. As your seekers become, you know, enter apprentice masons and work up the ladder, give them the information that's appropriate for their level for safety. Of course, we never want to give our playbook out to strangers, seekers, unknown entities, but as your folks are kind of growing in their journey, it's okay to give them the information so they know as well. And really, we want to continue to grow the team. It's never a bad thing to have more people than you need, and then your team leader can decide, okay, you three are going to be parking lot, you guys are going to be rovers, you're going to be in the lodge, you're our safety defender. It's a good problem to have, to have too many interested people. But again, communicate, discuss everything that's going to happen so that if there's an event, you're going to have a plan. So in summary, at your lodge, I would really encourage you to start talking about safety. Have a coffee, talk to your brothers, talk to your leadership. Say, what can we do? Do we have a team? What's our plan? Let's develop a team. Regardless if you're in the smallest community or the largest, you can still start this process. You can develop a team, you can research, you can assess what your needs are, find out who your local people are. You're gonna plan, you're gonna implement. We're gonna learn from it, we're gonna revise, we're gonna fix things, we're gonna revisit it. The goal of all these things is so we can have a really safe lodge and so hopefully eventually, our biggest problem is complaining that the meatloaf didn't taste right and then we can kind of haze the cook. That's the goal, that should be our biggest problem, not this other stuff. So thank you so much for your time, I really appreciate it. And if we can ever be of service, please don't hesitate to reach out and have a wonderful day.